Hello, all you spry tubers, twitchers, and pod people out there. Welcome to the Could You Do It Better podcast, where filmmaker, gamer extraordinaire, and the behind the scenes awesomeness known as Sesh, and the writing and directing sensation known as Maria, discuss popular television shows and movies and answer the always controversial question of Could You Do It Better? Today, we will be discussing Season 1, Episode 1 of Lauren Schmidt Hisrick's The Witcher television series based upon Andrzej Sapkowski's The Witcher novel series. And as for me, I'm Jonathan the Intern, and unlike our two experts, have no industry experience whatsoever. In other words, I'm much like Renfrey's Merry Men. I'm not personable, barely have a third grade education, I have the swordplay skills of a 98-year-old great-grandmother with rheumatoid arthritis and a double hip replacement, and I was last seen face down in the street covered in my own bodily fluids. <laughs> and now, to Sesh and Maria. Woo! Clean <laughs> yourself up, intern. We got to get to the podcast. <laughs> Yes, yes, we are <laughs> premiering our new show by going over the pilot of The Witcher today. Uh, we'll see uh, what people think of it coming up. Um, and as usual, we've got some spoiler warnings for you. Uh, in this episode, we will be doing a detailed recap of that first episode of The Witcher TV series, uh, so there will be spoilers throughout. If you haven't watched this episode and don't want to hear spoilers before you do, Please feel free to put us on mute as you watch the episode, then rewatch our show afterwards, because that's how you double those view counts. And now, on to the recap as mandated by our legal department. We open on a river in a dark forest, where a young fawn is watching a pale man being drowned by a giant crab spider, bringing to life Phil Collins' something in the air tonight. <laughs> but Geralt turns the tables, grabs his sword and stabs the creature clean through the skull. Ah, well, off to the local tavern to find the alderman, who I can only assume by the job title is the crab spider's next of kin. <laughs> the small town bar doesn't like Geralt's, ah, uh, we'll call it ilk, and wants to fight him due to his background. But a woman with bracers named Renfrey steps in to claim him as she goes for the bad boys and offers to get him out of his clothes. <laughs> Flirtus interruptus by the alderman's daughter, Marilka, who informs Geralt that he killed the wrong monster. You know, the one for population control. He actually needed to kill the other one in the swamp next door. So she takes him to the local sorcerer's tower to meet Stregobor, a sorcerer hiding in his own personal garden of earthly delights, who, who tasks Geralt to kill a human monster, Renfrey. Well, she did seem to want to eat him alive. Oh. <laughs> Over. <laughs> Over to a girl who's clearly royalty slumming in the streets playing jacks for bread as Jasmine is her favorite Disney princess, only to be summoned back to court by her knightly bodyguard. Now, how is she supposed to make friends with the cool kids? Back to Stregobor, telling a yawn about how the big bad Lilith has reappeared after 1,200 years, cursing 300 young women, mutating them to be the destruction of all mankind. Of course, he, Stregobor, last hope of humanity, has killed 299 of them himself. But Renfrey fought back, so he created his own nudie bar and <laughs> contracts out witchers to take care of it. Of course. Geralt slowly backs out of the tower. Back to the castle of Gala, where the queen gets news of impending war with the neighboring town. She decides not to prepare tonight and instead go with the time-honored strategic decision of tonight we dance, tomorrow we die. <laughs> Cut to the river where an herb-gathering Geralt is disrupted by Renfrey, who tells her tragic backstory of being hunted and raped by Stregobor's men. And so she swears allegiance to Lilith and vengeance on Stregobor. Geralt tells her to renounce her vengeance lest she becomes the monster they say she is. Over to the battle, and the king and queen of Sintra appear terribly overmatched. Not only are they much smaller in number, but they're also on the low ground. Interspersed slow action battlefield death scenes. Back to the castle, where Princess Sirius told the same story Stregobor told Geralt earlier in the castle's uh, earlier by the castle sorcerer Mousesack. Clearly, they're on the same monthly wizard newspaper mailing list. 
back to the battle where the king and queen may be losing badly, but at least they find a nice secluded spot on the battlefield to talk about the weather and reinforcements before the king takes an arrow to the eye. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'll be The poor queen lets out a death wail that'd make front men for Scandinavian black metal bands proud. Back to the castle where we find the queen gravely wounded, telling Siri their city is under siege. Mousesack puts up a reflecting wall to keep the opposing army from overrunning the castle. Over to Geralt in the forest, talking to his horse, telling it about the good times, like killing a rapist, only for the girl he saved to pass out in fear of him instead of thanking him. <laughs> the eavesdropping Renfrey tells Geralt, tomorrow she goes, but tonight she comes. <laughs> Slow motion kiss ensues. Back to the castle, which is also feeling the heat but with hundreds of flaming arrows instead of lips. The gate is breached. There is no last stand. The queen accepts her fate, but in her last action tells Ciri to escape with Mouse Sack and find Geralt, for he is her destiny. Ciri screams and shakes the room. She must have some of her mom's demon in her after all. As Ciri is escorted out, the queen has her men hand out free flasks of suicide, po suicide potion, then Swan dives out the window into the ransack city. Siri, Mousesack, and bodyguard Laszlo make it out of the castle, but as they attempt to escape on horseback, they are spotted by the leader of the Nilfgaardian army. Mousesack attempts to stave off the attack, but the leader is a dead-eye archer, and one shot kills him. Switch back to Geralt in the forest of pleasure, uh, having post-coitus sex dreams, prophesizing he'll be stoned in the market. Geralt, clearly attracted to the girl, shows up where he is met by Renfrey's crew, who offer him an ultimatum of, yes, dying. Geralt chooses the side where everyone but him dies and dispatches them all easily. Renfrey enters holding Marilka hostage, saying she won't leave until Stregobor is dead, and so she crosses swords with Geralt. She is a highly skilled sword fighter and is able to stab Geralt in the gut with a sneaky offhand dagger. Geralt responds by overpowering her guard, driving his sword into her shoulder. She slashes him back in the leg. Oh, this scene is definitely going to end in baby making. <laughs> he, he puts a sword to her throat, but she doesn't concede. She pulls her dagger and oh my gosh, she gets stabbed in the neck. Her last words are, the girl in the woods will be with him always. Man, this whole viewing audience just got blue balls. Change the scene to the Nilfgaardian leader carrying away Siri on horseback. Siri shrieks and the horse throws them both. She screams so loudly she fells an obelisk and opens a steadily expanding chasm between her and her captor. Man, that's some hardcore demon stuff right there. Stre <laughs> Stregobor leaves his tower to find everyone dead. But as he goes to get an autopsy of Renfrey, Geralt steps in and draws his sword. Stregobor turns the town on him just as Renfrey said he would, and the stoning begins. Marilka tells him never to return, and Geralt angrily leaves to find the girl in the woods. End episode. This episode is brought to you by bewitching bouncy castles. Ah, inflatable bounce houses, beloved by children and doctors of all ages. They truly are the go-to party accessory for parents looking to keep their unsupervised children occupied for long enough to throw back the three or four cocktails needed to forget about life and impending thoracic spine injuries for a while. Well, here at Bewitching Bouncy Castles, we not only keep this novelty alive, our newest innovation is both transparent and portable. So whether you want to just toss your kids inside to give them an awesome escape room experience, or you want just 15 minutes of time to yourself in the bathroom contemplating life without someone pounding on the door because you deserve it, damn it. This product is for you. That's Bewitching Bouncy Castles, where problems bounce right off of you. Back to you, Sesh and Maria. Ooh, thank you for that. I'm merely a messenger. This is all legal's bidding. <laughs> well, I'm excited to dive in. Um, our first question of the night is, does this episode do a good job of setting up the immersion into the world and themes? Sash, you want to get us started? Yes. And yes, it does so brilliantly. I would say that is just a fact. Uh, <laughs> the setting of a small town and the townsfolk speaking of rumors and old stories they've heard of witchers while Geralt simply reacts 
really conveys what is true, what is rumored, and what is just town folk being bigoted in a very concise way. It's it's just such a better method than the fish out of water method we often see in fantastical stories where the main character is the oddball out of place. This is done really smart too, where Geralt doesn't exactly spend any time correcting anyone. It's more about us just reading his reactions and freaking great acting with all the people around him. Uh, the morality of choice is at the mantle of themes in this, and they do a wonderful job of presenting it to us, where even though the situations are pretty unique to the world of The Witcher, we as an audience can absolutely understand everything we need to. We get a great taste that there are monsters as creatures, monstrous people, um, that this world is not a fair one or very much a typical fantasy story. Both of our hero heroes, despite their uh, trained abilities or past privileges, will still have their own struggles that we can sympathize with or emphasize with. Yeah, yeah, I think that was really well said. Um, so far, I, I, I do agree. Um, you have that dark, gritty medieval environment, an impending dark prophecy, and some very likable, albeit now deceased characters, <laughs> um, I think uh, the thing I like the most about this pilot episode, though, is the focus on morality and ethical decisions, and how no matter how unwilling you are to choose between two evils or remain neutral or apathetic, eventually the choice will be forced upon you, and I absolutely love those implications. All too often in shows, they are so character-centric that it's almost like time is at a standstill when the main characters are making pivotal decisions. And heck, I mean, they usually even get a soliloquy <laughs> thrown in there for free as well. I, I, for one, love a world that has an engine driving it that doesn't give a damn about the characters and is instead a steady metronome hitting the beats like a jackhammer as it drives the story to oblivion. You either make a timely decision or the world decides for you and moves on with or without you. Well, I'd have liked a little bit more background on how this dystopian world came into existence and how the characters got to this point. For a pilot, I think this set up some of the world building and the major story arc in a very competent uh, fashion. Yeah, for me, um, absolutely. It almost does it too cleanly. <laughs> I mean, no moment of time feels wasted. Everything has meaning and purpose from having little knowledge or background on what the Witcher is outside of being based on a video game. I was drawn into this heady world, putting a twist on biblical Adam and Eve themes and leaving me wondering who the true big bad is, all while deftly introducing and then murdering really likable characters. That was great. Um, our next question is, what do you think of the characters and dialogue in this first episode? Jonathan, you want to start us off? Uh, sure. Um, I thought that the uh, the characters were extremely likable, uh, very distinct, and appeared to be extraordinarily well-developed for a pilot. Um, in most pilots, you generally don't see a full commitment to character direction or personality, as you're still learning how they fit in the universe. But this pilot really did a great job of defining the characters and sticking to it throughout this episode. That said, I am fairly nervous and that they killed off like 75% of the characters they introduced. Um, and I, I liked some of those characters too, uh, especially, uh, especially Renfrey. And I thought, uh, thought the king and queen, I, I thought they were great too. Uh, as for the dialogue, I did feel that struggled a bit as it was a little bit too on the nose and expository at times, especially with regards to the Lilith and Demon Blood storyline that I can't help but think could have been introduced more naturally. Uh, that said, when you have to introduce an entirely new world and characters, you are going to have to deal with some exposition in the pilot. Overall though, the dialogue had moments of cleverness and the chemistry between Geralt and Renfri uh, and between the king, queen and princess uh, was readily apparent to me. So I, I think a really great, uh, great job there. It seems like all the uh, actors really were getting along. 
Um, I absolutely love the characters. The introduction of each one and the way they play out and are connected to The Witcher, either actively or passively, is wonderful. Not only are the characters unique, but the dialogue, while sometimes a bit expository, like you said, still manages to feel genuine because it is so well intertwined with the action and needs of the characters. Each character's desire is clear and runs in opposition with events being played out in front of them, which really drives the story powerfully. I I also feel there was a really good balance of dialogue that showed not just desire, but personality, which went a long way to immediately attach me to the characters and wish I could get to know each one before brutally murdering them and making me sad. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I will say there's a lot of information they do have to get across with this fantasy world, so I don't mind them having a little extra exposition there. But otherwise, like, yeah, I think it's freaking perfect. <laughs> Everything everyone chooses to say and not say, looking at you, Geralt, is excellent <laughs> for conveying everything we need to know about what the characters are thinking and who they are as people. All while still moving the story forward. That's perfect to me. That's exactly what dialogue and unsaid dialogue writing is when it is at its best. I really love that despite the heaviness and darkness of the plot and events, that the humor feels appropriate. None of the jokes or humor are at bad times that ruin the drama, and every attempt at being funny hits the mark for me. Um, from the queen and the king talking with Siri and her little gross comments, the side characters somehow making me laugh about killing dogs, and especially the absolute king of sarcasm and perfect humor delivery, Geralt. Uh, his very first line to the poor little fawn that was slashed by the monster in the opening perfectly captures him using humor to lighten up an unfortunate situation, which we come to discover he does a lot even if it's just to himself. Uh, <laughs> later, when he says uh, he's full from venison, that's a joke to himself. Just him. <laughs> and that has me thinking he's had an unfortunate life, maybe coping with some humor to get by. That kind of humor is probably my favorite kind, and I love that Geralt sometimes needs to lift his own spirits. Uh, <laughs> one other great line um, that did not feel forced to me um, that I think perfectly gracefully established something essential that us audience people needed to know was the timeline. So when Renfri mentioned the queen of Sintra had just won her first battle, for us, the audience, um, that helps us establish the timeline that with Geralt's part of the story and that that's taking place many years before the events at the castle of Ciri, back when her grandmother was her age. And two, uh, the Renfri is actually making a really good point to illustrate what her life could have been. Like, it's a damn good argument she's making. Like, it wasn't just to show us that bit of information. She actually had a good convincing argument. I love that the creators choose, uh, chose to reveal the time difference, like, mid-episode <laughs> as a great place to just change some of the context and to keep us on our toes. I really have nothing yep, but nothing good but things good to say about the dialogue. I had no idea that they were shot at different times. That went over my head a little bit too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I thought it was all the same <laughs> timeline. I just thought that Renfrey was Siri's mom, and I'm like, right. oh, she, you know, she was, uh, she, was, she was assaulted as a kid, you know. And, yeah. Huh. Wow. Right? New context now. Spoiler warning. Spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, good to know. This is why uh, why uh, why it's good to have somebody who knows the series bring in the knowledge sesh. The show is worth a rewatch. Is why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our next question um, is: How do the king and queen size up to other representations of royalty we've seen in other shows? Um, I love this couple. Oh, they felt like human beings with integrity who really did love their people and had a genuine regal attitude with the trimmings of excess yet managed great responsibility. The queen was truly in love with her king and also in love with her people. She fought mightily to protect them. Their brief interaction showed deep abiding love for each other and their granddaughter. The battle they fought getting in the mud with their knights showed just how invested they were and their ultimate demise felt like the loss of the soul of their land. 
so that we can see their granddaughter struggle against soulless marauders after her power. Uh, the king was layered at once seeming laissez-faire about his duties while not missing an opportunity to teach his granddaughter and show up for his queen emotionally and when it really counted in battle. This layering really worked well and when he was so quickly wiped out, you really felt the death of true love even <laughs> though <laughs> we've only seen them for a brief time. Uh, this is a giant contrast to say the House of the Dragon where the connection to the soul of both of the characters at least for me, was never strong and definitely not immediate. Yeah, pretty fair. Yep. Uh, I freaking loved every scene with them. They felt real. They felt loving. They had heart and values and, importantly, some flaws, too. They were so well-rounded as characters. I actually forgot they both died in episode one. <laughs> <laughs> um, Seeing the grandmother queen and the king in battle was just badass. That felt great to establish this world's order and their culture of strength um, that very few actually have things really easy in life, um, even if they're a king and queen. Uh, they weren't spoiled royalty. They might still have been royalty, though. Um, there is a sense that they earned it to some degree and have had hardships. The queen won a battle as a young teenager, and the trauma of it still is with her. And we see that the Lion Cub series has no mother or father presently. So we know there is more loss there, too, for her and the queen. Both grandparents clearly love Siri, too. Uh, from all of the appearances um, we have, uh, from all appearances, it looks like they cared about raising her well. Um, so they gave her a little slack here, but... It doesn't seem like they gave her too much. Where responsibilities were still taken seriously in the end. Their banter is so enjoyable. They got on each other's nerves, but clearly still love each other throughout. Like it's just so refreshing to see an imperfect family that is just perfectly grounded and believable in a fantasy. Like the title of Lion feels very earned with this family. Yeah, I mean, in general, I think it was a welcome departure from from what we've seen in a lot of uh, uh, films and other television shows. I did enjoy seeing the more jocular and relaxed nature of royalty going through the motions of the royal events and parties while having a good laugh that it just out of beer's reach. You know, I also <laughs> like that they were being uh, presented as kind and caring leaders, the types which you would want to bend the knee to and declare loyalty to. You don't see a lot of uh, a lot of shows or movies like that either. Um, and I also liked how they led their own armies into battle, which actually is far more consistent to history mm -hmm. than the sitting comfortably in a war room far from the battlefield and, uh, and danger. And if you think about it is why should the people follow somebody who isn't actually going to fight for them? You know, it, it doesn't make much sense. So overall, I feel they did a great job with the representation, and dare I say, it was better than most royal representations we're accustomed to. Um, hats off to the show on this one for me. Good job. So our next question of the evening is, if you were Stregobor, how would you have attempted to convince the Witcher to kill Renfri? <clears throat> So I'll start with this one. I would have illustrated a scene around them showing the damage Renfrey could do if left unchecked, uh, showed death and destruction all around, illustrated a man being hypnotized and then murdered by Renfrey. His presentation was terrible. <laughs> I mean, firstly, walking into his freaky garden of Eden would just leave a person thinking this guy has a weird fetish for that part of the Bible and clearly is not grounded in reality. So when he <laughs> to me talking about this weird Lilith paranoia as I see naked ladies eating apples all around him I like the Witcher would give his cause a hard pass you know <laughs> to our viewing audience out there nothing quite says legitimacy like proclaiming yourself the mayor of a magical garden of Eden populated by dozens of mindless nude imaginary friends of your own creation and requesting a murder for hire for a girl who might have a genetic deformity of an internal organ that occurred during an eclipse. <laughs> yeah, I would have gone with a simple illusion of a table, maybe a library filled with notes and records, 
you know, and told Geralt that there's a girl in town named Renfrey that you have conclusive evidence is trying to raise a demon and is responsible for murdering citizens and travelers as part of her tribute to Lilith to spawn this demon and that the town can't do anything to stop her. She's become too dangerous and powerful. Then offer him good coin to destroy her before she raises more demonic creatures, like the one Geralt just so happened to kill on his way into town. It also would have helped if he just contacted the Witcher in the first place to visit his tower, offering payment for his task instead of the more convoluted, waiting for him to show up at the local tavern with his kill, asking for this alderman, and then having his minion co-opt him for his own task. I mean, why leave things to chance when you can simply make your own narrative? That's right, folks. Do the crime and then say what happened in the story later. <laughs> Should I do any crimes? Uh, that's a felony. Yeah, I mean, he, uh, you know, likes destiny. So <laughs> uh, Strogobar is kind of a tongue twister for me. I might just call him the warlock sometimes. So that's who I mean, by the way. Um, his ego got in the way of him making any progress with Geralt. It was not a good pitch to begin with, but he didn't shift gears as things were clearly not going well for his argument. First up, Geralt was being pretty obvious. Uh, he was <laughs> clearly uh, not into the idea of myths, legends, and, you know, some of the fabulously delicious sarcasm. It was very clear. When the warlock finally caught Geralt's attention, it was when he mentioned the mutations from birth. At this point, he really should have gone more into that, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know, all start off as normal humans. Both go through um, a process that includes physical trials as well as just simply beating the odds and surviving different potions slash poisons that mutate them for enhanced abilities. So it's kind of strange that someone is born with that kind of stuff. So pointing that out, um, that she was somebody that shared the mutations of witchers, but without the training, without the discipline or principles, who has been using her abilities for evils, you know, from his perspective, and learning, leaning more into how somebody immune to the effects of magic could be a bad thing would have been a much better approach. I'm not sure what the argument for the last thing would be other than proof that she has mutations, but hey, this guy sucks as a person anyway, so I'm not sure yet. <laughs> He's, he just has some old guy douchey thinking on stuff. <laughs> I kind of realized something new for the first time here. Um, thinking about it a little bit more, I realized that maybe this was intentional from the creators. Maybe it was just a natural lair. But he mentions how that he's aware that witchers uh, don't have feelings, which is quite the contrast to the idea to who he thinks Renfrey is, the woman. So she, with witcher-like abilities... Uh, she's like you, Mr. Richard, but emotional, essentially, is what his argument is. So, yeah, this guy's just sexist and privileged, or I'll just call it his whole pompous vibes didn't help make his case to Geralt overall either. And, yeah, you know, Geralt still preferred to just stay out of it, so I guess the case was made well enough to be neutral. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm fairly uh, fairly fairly certain uh, having a litany of, of naked people running around <laughs> you is is also probably not the best way to. Yeah, can I also add that I just absolutely love that Gerald called him out on it, and not even in an offensive way. Just what is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, especially when he said that like witchers. They're not like like impressed by any of this stuff. Like the magic doesn't quite work on them. Like you know, it, it would be like oh, okay, that's that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's great. Right. Our next question tonight is: If you had to face torture or take poison, what would you do? Man, what what a what a question. <laughs> And and why why is legal and HR in this room with with their notebooks out writing furiously right now? 
I mean, I, I get the sinking feeling that that, that uh, they might have posed this question for fire dismissal purposes. <laughs> so um, for me, while poison is definitely a more preferable option if both methods are 100% guaranteed to end in death. However, if death isn't a guarantee, going torture allows you to possibly come up with an escape plan or a way out. So for me, I'd go torture and hope I can figure out how to strike the right nerve and turn the tables before things get to the point where I start <laughs> losing appendages. Oh, Yeesh. Uh, yeah, oh, oh, no. HR is smiling at me. That is not good. That is not good. It's been a nice time, guys. Oh, gosh. Yeah. yeah. OK. So I view life much like story. How we live our lives is how we write our story. Uh, what do you want your ending to be? Who is my audience? If I am a queen, it will be the history books of whoever survives the battles. So I want to go out as extreme as possible, showing an example of bravery. A lot of things in our lives are out of our control, but our choices aren't. I pray I will never have to face such a decision, and I have no idea how I would actually react under the circumstances. However, I want my ending to have meaning, and to me, meaning would be attempting to take out as many bad guys as I can before my demise. If that means making homemade bombs whoa, whoa. and lighting us up, whoa, whoa. I just like where this is going. Keep going. That is not, not okay by legal. <laughs> do not do that at home. That is not recommended else. by a member in the, of this in the panel. Universe. Uh, I, <laughs> In the castle, I know for sure. There's no way I'm gonna make it out. Oh, it's look. time to, to to drop the bombs on everybody. Look at that. HR and legal have left the room now. No, I'm the only one. I wanna help. Oh, Um, Sesh. Does it? I'm gonna die. Hey, can you hear me? Whoa, now we whoa, can hear you. Yes. Now we can hear you. All I heard was die. Die. <laughs> <laughs> I got very excited when you started talking about bombs. I wanted to change my answer to that because that's amazing. Yes, no, I'll make no. bombs with you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> go out with a bang, literally. Um, but yeah, um, damn, I wasn't expecting a which way do you want to die question. <laughs> Jeez. Okay. So um, personally, I would think a random bottle of poison sounds pretty rough as I didn't see an instruction booklet that describes the side effects of the process of probably liquefying the insides. Um, now, if it's actually a peaceful process of falling asleep, maybe I would choose that because torture is just not the way to go at all. Definitely not. Um, so if escape or defecting to the other side or bombing the place is not an option, uh, could I actually just make another different like fifth or sixth choice? <laughs> I think just like simple blood loss would probably be nicer, you know, like a little a little wrist stab or that, you know, the big leg artery. Just a, a little nice little like, oh, go to sleep and then you're you're good. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll bomb the place if I could. Sounds great. I mean, yeah, just, yeah, this kind of choice sucks. Damn. <laughs> to any government or regulatory agency who might be hearing this conversation, this is about a television show. It should not be taken seriously. If, if I'm in a castle and it's being sieged and no, they don't take prisoners, yes. No, bombs. no. Nobody, nobody on this podcast <laughs> goes ahead and recommends people do that. I'm, you know, I'm kind of surprised they didn't have more like ways to hide in there or escape or traps because they know they're not like the strongest place. I would have had like some kind of Indiana Jones style traps for people or something. When I said they were flawed, I think they were a little cocky, a little overconfident in their situation. Yeah. That's sad. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> so Rest in next... peace, everyone. <laughs> Our next question is, 
is it possible to be truly um, on no one side, apolitical? I'll start with this one. No, I think the Wisher unknowingly illustrated that in this episode. Being present to a rape scene and choosing to either let it happen or kill the man is both a choice. Doing nothing is allowing, and allowing is very political. Uh, he killed the man, and that made a statement. He killed Renfrey, even though he tried to stay out of it. He really was taking Stregobor's side. Giving Renfrey an ultimatum to leave her battle with Stregobor or, or be killed to, be is, to me is simply taking the sword for Stregobor. If he believed that uh, if he believed the war between Renfrey and Stregobor is strictly their business, he would not have given her an ultimatum. If he didn't give her an ultimatum, that would have made Stregobor conclude he is on Renfrey's side. Unless he left town and went far away, uh, his very presence requires a choice, in my opinion. That is true. The presence requires a choice. So I think at times that, yes, you can feel that way as Geralt says there are many amounts of evils all are still evil as he puts it um, sometimes every option is just not a good option the lesser of two evils is still going to be evil but what I love that the show depicts well is that despite the conviction of being a political and yourself like Geralt may try to be uh, you still may be forced to choose and choices have to be made sometimes even if there are no good choices I had originally seen this first season before ever playing any of the video games, and I hadn't known this was one this of those games the- where you are constantly making choices about what to say and how you treat other characters in the game and how you handle the monsters. I absolutely love that this show is about making hard choices that can really leave not only Geralt, but the audience conflicted at times. The idea of choice being so central to the whole story and to Geralt's story is also mirrored in uh, the Warlocks and Renfrey's dispute where they each claim they didn't have a choice with their past actions. And as far as the storytelling aspect, one of the best things you can do to develop a character is to put them in situations where they make choices. Their choices are their character as a person. Um, Just like in real life, the choices we make is a defining factor to who we are as people. Ah, well then, <laughs> I actually am going to disagree with both of you. Uh-huh. <laughs> I actually do believe it to be possible, um, though it does come with certain unfortunate consequences. A lot of decisions that we make in life we don't think about, and as such, they are almost completely apolitical. It's only when we start looking at how our thoughts and opinions may shape others' viewpoints or start philosophizing about the kind and type of society we want to live in where things start getting political. So as long as you couldn't care less about how your thoughts or interactions affect others and you care little about the overarching environment, laws, and rules around you, you absolutely can stay apolitical. Of course, the catch is... In order to do this, you pretty much naturally have to be a complete hedonist without any conscience. (laughs) Like, picture a Dorian Gray hedonist to the point where you're likely a serial killer amongst a litany of other unconscionable actions. It it wouldn't be pretty. Um, But sadly, I do think that there are real-world examples of this where you have people who just um, don't really follow uh we'll call it we'll call it the law but really it's even more than that they just do what they want um they don't think about anything or consequences they just do it because they like it and they want to do it and it is often why uh unfortunately uh serial killers are so hard to find at times especially the ones where they mix up just what they're doing because it's just random that's really disturbing and sad. On to ratings. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we get there, what a wonderful bunch of questions we asked today that clearly is going to possibly give us all a timeout from most of our platforms after we get responded to. Um, let's go ahead and see if we have any of our audience members going ahead and saying something today. <laughs> Might be your last time to interact with the show. So uh, um, we have 
We have Bear UNLV saying, this is my first time watching The Witcher and definitely love how well done it is so far, especially in comparison to House of the Dragon. Mm. <laughs> you know, that'll, that'll do something to a show. It is it is important to surround yourself with, uh, with uh, less favorable options uh, when you want people to choose you and, and think highly of you. Oh, gosh. All yeah, right. we're going into the fully able to love it so much more after House of the Dragon. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's a good question. If we if we watch this show right after The Watchmen, um, whether or not we we'd be, we, yeah, yeah, we'd be as high. It would be interesting because that also was a dystopian yeah. universe. I mean, it's such a different world going into future and then past. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it would be interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I would say pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, how how would you rate this show, Sesh? And what are your uh, 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 Yeah, so the part of the question. Um, I need to watch. Uh, yeah, this is a rewatch for me. So yes, absolutely. And I'm already enjoying it more than I expected to. It's great to revisit. And I'm looking forward to pulling apart the show episode by episode, especially for brand new fans of the series. Uh, I hope even more people watch it. I think... Uh, this might be a nine or maybe even a 10 out of 10 rating for me. Not that it's like my favorite episode ever of anything, but I say 10 out of 10 since I'm really not sure what they could have done to make a better first episode. The Witcher is is just a quality show and I think it deserves a lot of eyes on it, especially compared to so much of the media out there. Like it's it's gonna be fun to go on a journey with some newbies and live it again. Yeah, for me, yeah, absolutely. Uh, this show is awesome. Nearly every element of this episode is so tightly done, and to accomplish such a task in the first episode is incredible. Uh, first episodes are always so hard because so much ground has to be covered, and especially with this world. And a lot of times, you have to forgive the ch- the clunkiness of it all and save your reviews for the next one however they did a masterful job of establishing the world and drawing us into it kicking and screaming i can't wait to see the next episode i i would give this one a nine out of ten also uh, for for me i thought overall uh it did have some great cinematography um some intriguing though no longer living characters <laughs> um some some solid world building um i really thought the chemistry for the cast was great. That that you don't normally see in pilots, especially like that takes time. Um, and really, my only real complaint for the episode was uh, the the exposition of the primary Lilith story arc uh, by by Stregobor. Um, as such, uh, I give this a very solid start to a show. Um, mine's going to be a little bit lower. Uh, it's going to be an eight out of ten. Um, I, I, I'd give it an 8.5 out of 10 if Renfi was slash is still alive, though. Um, I, I, I just love that character. Yeah, I'm guessing maybe. I, I'm hoping. I'm hoping. I want to make the I, argument that Geralt demanded our warlock speak plainly <laughs> rather than keep thinking it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> See. <laughs> so, uh, you know, how dare you rate this under a nine? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, oh, we, yeah. we do, we do. Uh, Bear <laughs> says a solid nine because uh, uh, I wish it had a timeline thingy. Yeah, for me, um, I'm I'm rating it under under a nine simply because. I'm not going to say it was confusing to follow, but I didn't have enough information, I felt, at times to yeah. to really feel um, uh, deeply invested. Like, I thought there were things that the show did really, really well. Um, and I think an 8 out of 10 uh, shows that, that, I, that I like that. Um, however... Make it a 9 out of 10, please. <laughs> <laughs> You have, you have to understand. 
you know, uh, one of our previous series was uh, The Watchmen, which I thought was one of the best shows that's been on TV in years, you know. Um, and, and that's the problem when you have that 1 through 10 rating system, right? You're always comparing it to other yeah. uh, to, to, to other shows, um, you know, <clears throat> comparing it to uh, Battlestar Galactica's pilot episode, uh, not the miniseries mm -hmm. movie, but 33, you know, uh, it's it's going to fall a little, like, like compared to this, it's going to fall a little. Um, but overall, I thought it was a really, really well done episode. I, I genuinely think that how the main story arc was handled in terms of talking about Lilith, I think that actually could have been done a, a cleaner way, quite frankly, than how they introduced it. But it seems that Stregobor is an important character or that he will be an important character in this. Uh, so it makes sense that he'd be the involved one. in it. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You just want the uh, the trailer of Lilith coming down from Diablo. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, yes. 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 Give me the Diablo 4 trailer right now. That's that, that's exactly it. You nailed it. <laughs> Only way you can introduce Lilith. <laughs> All right. On that note, uh, any <clears throat> other questions uh, from the audience? Any ratings? Anything uh, you want to say about... Uh, uh, the new show that we're watching, uh, as well as, I guess, a welcome. Uh, I should have probably started with that. A welcome to anybody who is new, who is joining us um, after coming off of House of the Dragons and mm -hmm. The Watchmen. Um, uh, we will be attempting uh, to uh, do the full series of The Witcher that's been done so far, so mm -hmm. one a week. Uh, so expect these to keep coming so long as they are enjoyed by everybody and uh and i i have a feeling we're going to be able to ask more <clears throat> deeper questions in in this series than we than we could really with house of the dragons so i'm looking forward to that also yeah. Yeah. I'm just liking the show <laughs> <laughs> i get like liking it even if we don't love it like it's going to be so much more of an enjoyable process <laughs> All right, then, uh, on that note, uh, again, thank you so much for joining us this, this evening and watching us until the end. Um, we do really appreciate all your support, and hopefully we brought you some intelligent conversation and laughs tonight. And it's your support, of course, that makes this worth it, not our own selfish desires to uh, watch television and then talk about it with friends <laughs> for a while. A little bit, a little bit, tiny bit. <laughs> So if you like this show, please like, share, subscribe, heart, do all those likey things. And if you hated this show, please make sure to go ahead and you like this twice because we have metrics. They go ahead and they tell each person who liked it twice. Um, and that really shows us that this show needs attention and we can fully invest our time in making it better. Uh, so we're doing this for you people who hate it and like it multiple times. <laughs> um, our next episode will be on Monday, November 14th at no longer 8 p.m. Pacific. We're going to deal with the time change. That's right. For anybody who doesn't know, the United States just turned back the clocks. Most yeah. states. Boo! Down with daylight savings time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as such, we will now be having our show at 7 p.m. Pacific. That is 10 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, this also might make it easier for Eastern time uh, viewers. Uh, for those of you uh, outside the country, I know we have a few viewers uh, or a couple from uh, uh, Oceania, so Australia, uh, New Zealand, uh, some from uh india um hopefully this works for you if it doesn't let us let us know and uh send us a little nasty gram uh <laughs> label it intern and um you know say why are you changing the time on my my show but our next episode will be monday november 14th at 7 p.m pacific time 
10 p.m. Eastern, we will be discussing episode two of season one of The Witcher. So looking forward to seeing you then. And until next time, could you do it better? Not singing the song till we have the song. Happy <laughs> in seventh day, everyone. <laughs> All right, bye, guys. Bye.